Mr. President, I beg to move for the second reading of a bill shortly entitled Appropriation 2015-2016. Mr. President, this is an act to provide for the service of St. Dusha for the year ending 31st day of March 2016. Mr. President, the appropriation required is in the amount of $1,464,236. The schedule to the Act lists both the recurrent expenditure and the capital expenditure. Total recurrent expenditure is at one billion and fifty thousand one billion and one billion fifty thousand I will I will read it out because it's confusing me a little here. It's one zero five zero zero six nine two hundred and and fifty thousand. One yes, one million fifty million fifty million and sixty nine thousand two hundred. It's quite a mouthful to get over, Mr. President. Um, and the capital expenditure um, is broken down into the revenue grant and bonds uh, and others, but it gives you a total of four hundred and fourteen million one hundred and sixty six thousand eight hundred. Mr. President, as I rise, I invite members to support the Appropriation Act of 2015-2016. As I do so, Mr. President, I am minded of the fact that we are fast approaching the next general election. This is evident from the requirements of the Constitution of St. Lucia. And that's all. It is evident from the requirements of the Constitution of St. Lucia. So, honorable member on the other side, Mr. Joseph, you will have to wait for some more time. In that context, Mr. President, it is opportune for us to undertake some reflection on where we came from and where we are going. What has my government done with the monies entrusted to it to provide for the development of St. Lucia over the last few years? Equally, what or should St. Lucians expect of us in the future. We are now entrusting my government, Mr. President, as I said, with managing $1,464,236 for the fiscal cycle of 2015-2016. Mr. President, in our blueprint for growth of 2011, which is our manifesto of the St. Lucia Labour Party, and Mr. President, I have made this um, a document of the House on many occasions. I'm not sure if I need to, but I have a, a copy, should in case any member wishes to reference it. Um, we emphasize, Mr. President, in that blueprint for growth, that the nation, nation building had to be long term. And I will quote in that regard page three of our blueprint, and it says, Mr. President, and I quote, the goal of nation building is a long-term exercise. While we are confident in our ability to make immediate improvements in many important areas, we understand that there are no quick fixes to several of the problems facing us. Therefore, in this document, 
we depart from the practice of presenting a five-year manifesto and instead we set out our long-term goals and objectives for national growth and development. So it was clear, Mr. President, and we were clear that to build this country, we had to take into account a long-term vision. But Mr. President, we were also clear on what the former government had done and what they were doing. And we knew that it would take us a little time to correct some of the maladministration of the last government. Mr. President, we must recognize the blank and tattered canvas and broken brushes handed to us by the last government of the United Workers' Party. <coughs> it was a canvas of social and economic mismanagement. And the acceptance of a culture of corruption. Mr. President, I will go to the Social and Economic Review of 2010. And Mr. President, I ask this to be made a document of the House. Um, because, Mr. President, it was clear that even by 2010, when we were seeing the last of the life of the last government, that our country and economy was in decline. At page nine of that economic review of 2010, I quote the following. Preliminary data indicated that the fiscal performance of the central government deteriorated in the 2010-2011 fiscal year. Sorry, uh, I, I say page nine of the Economic and Social Review of 2010, but I believe, Mr. President, it is page nine of the Economic and Social Review of the 2011 report. I stand to be corrected, but it's page nine of the 2011 report, and I make that also uh, a document of the House, and it reads at page nine. Preliminary data indicates that the fiscal performance of the central government de deteriorated in the 2010-2011 fiscal year, registering an overall deficit of 174.4 million, or 5.5% of GDP, compared with 4% in 2009-2010. This trend had been reflected in the 2010 economic review. And I'd point specifically, Mr. President, to page eight of that economic review. So we saw that at the close of the life, the last chapter of the last government, we were seeing very serious fiscal deterioration taking place in the country. Mr. President, we must remember that 2010 saw a resurgence in the global economy. And this is the basis upon which the last government was in its last days. We were seeing a bit of a slight resurgence in the global economy. And Mr. President, that global economy saw activity with a 5.0% expansion in output. And that appears again in page one of the 2010 report. So whilst we were seeing a little buoyancy in 2010, and we saw the global economy showing a little buoyancy, our government was going into a deep and dark fiscal situation. Mr. President, whilst I will recognize and pause to make a note, that the last government, like our government, saw some factors 
that were beyond their control, and in particular, we are talking about the um, natural, natural elements. Just about that time we had, um, I know the last government had to face Hurricane Thomas, and that caused um, its share of difficulties. But, Mr. President, if you analyze the 2010 and 2011 uh, economic and social reviews, you will recognize that whilst these impacted negatively the situation of the government, the fiscal situation, and the need for the government to find resources to do certain things, but a lot of it really had to do with mismanagement and misguidance on the part of the last government, leaving us with a fiscal deficit in 2011 of 2 million 273, 2 billion, 273.2, sorry, 2,273.2 million dollars, or 68.5 percent of GDP, which moved it from, which moved it of GDP, and I'm quoting again page 9, of 20, the 2011 report. Mr. President, I'm taking a little time to make these points because I want us to understand what was beginning to happen when the last government was leaving office and when we were about and did resume office. Mr. President, I also spoke of wastage and I also spoke of corruption. And I will just pause to make a note here, Mr. President, so that we understand the climate that this government left behind, and also the climate that the former government left behind, and the climate that the former government continues to engage in. Mr. President, I point to the 2000 2014 report of the Integrity Commission, the annual report of the Integrity Commission for 2014. And this is as required under the Integrity in Public Life Act number four of 2006. And I make that again a document of the House, although it should have been late already, but I will nevertheless late again, to say, Mr. President, Senator, apparently the recorders are not picking you up, so perhaps you may want to use the podium which would elevate the microphone. That will be fine, Mr. President. Yeah. As you can see, Senator, it has been, it is much improved. There are no more books. <laughs> Mr. President, if that suggestion had come from the leader, from, from the other side, I would have taken it to mean that they wanted to throw me off. <laughs> but coming as it is from the Honorable President, I know that it is in the interest of doing good and better business in the House. Mr. President, I was saying that... The uh, just one minute, Senator. Are, are you all getting them? You need to adjust it. That's better? Is that better? Okay, all right, we are good. Yes, Mr. President, This all new technology, Mr. President, is, <laughs> is having the better of me. 
Mr. President, I was saying that the integrity report of 2014 and the requirement, I'm just trying to make the correct quote, Mr. President. Um, Page 19 of that report, Mr. President, I refer specifically to page 19 of that report. And you will see on page 19 of that report, Mr. President, that there is a very copious uh, presence of non-compliance by senior members of the former government. I will not say much more, but I say this to indicate the kind of atmosphere that had developed and continued to develop in this country um, under the former administration. So, Mr. President, there we were. We were at this point. The government was going out. The fiscal situation was deteriorating mismanagement of the economy, corruption, and taking no uh, opportunity to correct these problems, in came our government, a Labour Party government. Clearly, Mr. President, we needed to do a few basic things, housekeeping things. The first was to ensure that there was some fiscal stability. And of course, to ensure that we were able, secondly, to push forward our blueprint for growth, because this is our contract of faith with the electorate. But we also had to ensure that we set the tone for good governance in this country. And Mr. President, in 2014-2015, the last fiscal year, we saw a shift from the years before. In the early years, the government was trying to consolidate. But in doing so, it is important to note that we could not lock the country down. I've heard many members of the opposition say that for the, last, for the first couple of years of our government, we continue to spend. We continue to engage in certain activities. Of course, we had to. And this was necessary for a couple of reasons. First of all, there were ongoing projects and initiatives. The government could not simply shut down ongoing projects and initiatives. We had to see these to their conclusion. And secondly, because of the nature of what was happening in the economy, you could not simply introduce at that stage very tight fiscal controls to stifle the economy, because that is exactly what would have, would have happened. You needed to give the economy an opportunity to prepare itself a little for the challenges ahead. And so the first couple of years of this government, there was some spending. We had to spend to do certain things. If not, you would have had the kind of shock waves that would have gone through this economy would have been unmanageable. And that is also to include the unemployment that would have suddenly begun to spiral even further out of control than what we had under the last government. And so the first couple of years, we had to exercise a certain degree of modesty in how we would approach this difficult task of dealing with the financial um, melee that was unfolding under the last government. But by 2014, and moving on to 2015, we begin to see now a different, a slightly different approach and shift. And that is consistent with how we need to run our economies. In 2014, for the 2014-15 cycle, for the last fiscal year, expenditure by the central government fell by 2.4% to 1%. $1,109.2 million, 
with a 12.3 decline in capital expenditure to 235.4 million. In addition, overall current expenditure rose marginally by 0.7% to 873.8 million over that period. And Mr. President, over that period, we were committed to undertaking, undertaking certain initiatives, such as the expansion of the Castries to Groselais Highway. I'm saying so because we have debated this this morning, and I am going to touch on some of these matters as I proceed. That, and my colleague on the other side has asked, in, in a short sense, do we need to spend this type of money on this type of project when we are showing on the one hand that there is a certain degree of fiscal control, tightening in the fiscal control, yet we are spending um, what is relatively a large sum of money um, to do certain things? Well, the point is this, honorable members, that even in the moments of tight fiscal, fiscal control, you have to set the stage to move the economy forward. And you have to do that by a number of things. You have to inject, first of all, capital into the economy. And there has to be a consistent flow of that capital, which you get on such a large project because it is running over a period of time. You have to look to create a measure of employment as well. And this project is going to raise um, a certain amount of, of uh, employment. And you have, to, you have to ensure that government has some measure of control over what is, it is doing in terms of the injection of capital. And it does not leave that injection solely to the private sector. There are those economists who believe that some of this or a large percentage of this has simply to be left to the private sector. They are supposed to be the ones to inject this capital to turn the country around. But we must remember, Mr. President, that we are dealing with a very small economy. And the ideas of, of economics that is applies to large economic blocks and large economies is not necessarily the same follow through for, so, for small economies. You have to have an important role for government in a, cent in a small economy to jumpstart that economy. It cannot be left to our private sector alone. And indeed, Mr. <laughs> Mr. President, if we follow the record of our private sector and believe that our private sector will put its all into jump-starting this economy, I'm afraid this is not going to happen. So there's a role for both. But government has a central role in jump-starting that private economy. And I see uh, my good Senator Paul. Um, she, I know that it must be going through her mind that the tourism economy, in fact, the tourism sector is, in fact, doing a lot to jumpstart the economy. And I will get to the success of the tourism sector in a minute, but I, I, would, I would jump the gun and um, agree with you that the tourism sector has done its part to try to do so. But the, the salient point is that this is not going to work it alone. If government doesn't come in and do what it needs to do, it's not going to happen. And therefore, we can see the importance of a project such as this, which would give a continuation of capital into the economy, assist a bit with unemployment, but complement what the private sector is doing or should do to jumpstart this economy. Mr. President, I will therefore move quickly to one area of success, which I have alluded to a little, um, and that is the tourism sector. In 2014, we achieved the highest tourism arrivals ever in St. Lucia. 1.034 million visitors, an increase of 14.3%, with an increase of 14.3% in visitor expenditure to $2.0 billion. Mr. President, that has been achieved under this government. Under this government. 
Equally, we saw the highest number of stayover visitors, which grew by 6.1% to 338,158 guests and a record number of yacht arrivals, which was at 47,196. And that is page 17 and 18 of the economic re of the of the Government of St. Lucia Review of the Economy for 2014 at page 17 and 18. And if you look at the statistics there, Mr. President, you will see that what is happening in tourism is happening in a number of areas. It is happening in visitor, visitor arrivals. It is happening with our yachts. We are seeing good statistics with our hotel occupancy. And that tells us something. It tells us it's not part of the tourism sector that is becoming far more buoyant, but as a whole, we are seeing improvements taking place there. And this could only come, this could only come with the direct input and involvement of my government and the strategic management of this sector by the government, and in particular, the Minister of Tourism. And I would like to stop for a moment and compliment the Minister of Tourism and his staff. Minister Honorable Lord Theophilus for the excellent work that they are doing in this sector. Excellent work. And let me say, Mr. President, that we must remember that tourism is the key sector for our economy. It is the key sector that is going to drive our economy and has driven our economy for a while. And so, if we see that we are seeing these improvements, it should tell us something. It should tell us that we are poised for good things over the next few months to see other sectors begin to improve. Mr. President, I make these points to show that while we have had in our earlier years, a difficult period, the government continued to spend because it had to, to ensure that it met obligations and it reduced the shock to this economy. But at the appropriate time, we have now moved to take in firmer hand some of these shock measures that we need to take because we see that we are able to do it. Tourism is beginning to show that it is doing better. The revenue for tourism is beginning to show that it is doing better. Government's fiscal position is improving. And the fact that we were criticized up and down the corridors of St. Lucia for by the opposition, we have shown that it was in fact, it was in fact beneficial to ensuring that we had a better and tighter revenue control and revenue stream so that we could do what we needed to do. But Mr. President, in all of this, our government has tried to ensure that we provide the fallback for the sectors. We provide the fallback for the persons who are and have been affected by this um, economic crisis and bad governance and mismanagement by the last government. We provide some kind of support framework for those people who find themselves in situations of poverty and neglect. And Mr. President, over the last year, we have given special attention to our young persons. Under the National Apprenticeship and Placement Program, NAP, government continues to open avenues of employment for all young persons. The cumulative expenditure of that program is 50,556,700 $741.65. And Mr. President, I'm quoting here from page seven 
of the NICE year-end report for 2014-2015. The opposition for a long time has tried to fool this country to say that we are not giving attention to our young people on the issue of unemployment for our, our young persons. We have spent $50,556,741.65. And the record of employment is there. But I will mention some of the things that we've done and continue to do, Mr. President, this year to show how we are, are, are moving forward and the areas that we are giving support to. Yes, but first of all, you see, Mr. President, this is what I don't understand. My colleague on the other side is saying that unemployment is at 50%. Now, I mean, come on, 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 come on. Mr. President, I will, leave, I will leave some of this to my other colleagues because I'm not going to get too sidetracked by what is, so, what is clearly so out of sync with reality. Mr. President, some of the programs have included the Farm Labor Support Program. And this is a critical program, not just because of what it is doing for young persons, but part of the strategy of government to reach out to the farming community as part of this requirement that we improve agriculture and agriculture's contribution to the economy. One of the problems with our farming community has always been that our farmers have had difficulty supporting labor on their farms. And one of the things that this program attempts to do is to assist the farmers so that we can bring much of the unproductive sector that declined under your government back into focus. Yes, it takes time, and this is a point that I've raised over and over, if you spend four years destroying the country, it takes time to rebuild it. We cannot rebuild it in one day. Mr. President, 70 persons have been employed, 170 persons have been employed under that program, and 190 farmers have been trained, and 112 farmers have actually benefited to date from this program. This is not a program that only addresses technical skills, Mr. President, but it goes into life skills and accounting and other skills that are important for persons to manage and run the farms. And of course, Mr. President, but, but we have only started this over the last few years. You say, you say that there's a decline, but you have to give it time to work. You have to give it time to work, and the point is, and the point is, and I keep going back to this central theme, that when you destroy a country, it takes a little time to rebuild it. But we are seeing all of the positives. All of the positives are showing themselves, and I will go to, through them as I go through my presentation here, Mr. President. We have seen improvement in revenue collection, I said, and I would like to point to my own ministry, the Ministry of Legal Affairs which falls under my portfolio, Mr. President. In the financial year 2013-2014 and 2014-15, revenue exceeded its projection by 62% in 2013-14 and 16% up to now in between 2014, sorry, 2014 and 15. No. Much of this had to do with the reorganization of our civil registry. Remember, we had chaos in our civil registry when you were there for years, people on the street in front of the registry fainting and falling down under the last government, and they did absolutely nothing. We took the bold step. We reorganized it. We did what was required to get it in working order. And ask anyone in the country today, in the, in the length and breadth of St. Lucia today, have they seen a difference in the civil registry between your government and when we are now? And they will tell you, yes, we've cleaned up the mess, the unholy mess that you left behind, Mr. President. 
and revenue collection has moved from a $413,981 to $884,449, Mr. President, in the last financial year. Mr. President, I'd like to place on record my appreciation to the Permanent Secretary and the Registrar and other senior employees and employees. And also, Mr. President, we have in, the, in that department, particularly as it relates to the Civil Registry, we have a number of nice workers. And I would like to pay special um, tribute to these workers who have given quite a bit to allowing us to improve in the professional service that we are giving um, as part of our mandate. So I thank them all for their contribution. Mr. President, in that regard, while in 2012, 23,464 applications of vital records were processed, this grew to 40,224 in 2000. And 14. In 2014, the registrar also processed 5,314 registrar's rectifications. And Mr. President, a further important contribution to this landscape by my government was the introduction of legislation to address the issue, the vexing issue of individuals who had to seek rectifications to their baptism, birth, sorry, their birth certificates, their marriage certificates, and so on, these records of civil status. Mr. President, I should say to you that we had, again, absolute and total chaos. We had persons who, for years, were using certain names that they were known by and could not have appropriate rectifications done. The best scenario in most cases, Mr. President, was that they had to undertake what we call deed polls. That is, change their name by way of deed. But their birth certificates could not be changed to reflect, um, to reflect the identity that they had carried. We were able to make certain changes by way of this legislation that brought significant relief to many suffering people Many, many suffering people, and I, I want to say that, you know, that, that these are some of the things sometimes that we forget, that we speak of caring governments, and we often say that our governments are caring, and our governments are contributing to the social landscape. But, Mr. President, what is needed is that in the practice of your day-to-day -day life, that the government is qualitatively changing the value of your life your day-to-day -day life, the things that affect you in a meaningful way that you want to see your government changing this and adding true value to your life. And these are some of the areas that we are adding true value to our lives, and I'm glad the opposition is supporting me there. I knew that I would live to see the day when members of the opposition were able to stand up and say, yes, we are doing it right, and I thank you for that. Mr. President, With respect to the criminal courts, we have also seen the introduction of a new criminal judge. And Senator, you have 15 minutes left to conclude. 50 or 15? 15. 15. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mr. President. Give me, give me a little more time, please. Mr. President, I would like to invoke Standing Order 34, 35, sorry, 35 to call for a suspension of, um, 35 to the call for a suspension of 35 one to allow the Honorable Leader of Government Business an additional 30 minutes to complete his presentation. Thank you. Senators, the question is that Standing Order 35 one be suspended to allow an additional one? 
an additional 30 minutes in which the leader of government business to conclude his presentation. And now for the question, as many of that opinion say aye. aye. <laughs> as many as a country opinion say no. Proceed, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, members, for giving me this further time. Mr. President, we have also moved to institute what we call bedside registration at Victoria Hospital. And this is a very important um, introduction because a lot of our records, a lot of the problems with our civil re uh, records is as a result of this gap between the time when a child is born at the hospital and registered. Usually there's a gap and usually the child is registered um, a little way down and of course it's com further complicated by our former use of baptism certificates and the priests of the old days and pastors and so on who in some cases um, were trying to do their best but got it wrong. And so we are trying to move to this position of bedside registration and we started this process at Victoria Hospital and this year we anticipate that we will move to the south and do it at the hospital in the south as well. Um, and so to date, 1,089 births have been registered, and we are hoping to extend this, as I say, to St. Jude's. And we are hoping to extend this to St. Jude's. Mr. President, I also want to touch on the Royal St. Lucia Police Force because we had a difficult year with the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. As we undertook a major investigation and review of all instances of killings by police officers of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force during 1st January 2010 to 31st December 2012. And again, Mr. President and I, it's almost like a nursery rhyme. Again, this was as a result of the conduct of governance by the last administration and the failure of the last minister of national security to keep on top of his job. Yes, I know you want to see the report in time. In fact, it might be a blessing for you because if you would see if the report was published now, you would have not a ghost of a chance winning one seat in the next general election. So be thankful for that. Mr. President, we had to deal with this and what the last government left us. But I must say, Mr. President, that a large majority of our police officers continue to act professionally and continue to subscribe to the requirements of the office and to act honestly. They are standing up, Mr. President, for what is right and committed to professional standards. And I say to all of these officers and to all of them, who have been part of that positive process, that both the government of St. Lucia and St. Lucians commend them for continuing to stay the course. And Mr. President, it is that professionalism that ensured that during the period 1st January 2014 to 31st December 2014, although we had an increase in reported crimes of 5.5% or 1,046, over the same period for 2013, the detection rate increased by 3% over the 2013 figures. In addition, Mr. President, we saw decreases in almost all major crime categories, including murders, crimes against a person, sexual offenses, and firearm offenses. And you'd never believe that, you know, Mr. President. You'd never believe that from what the media has been saying over these last years of the government's 
of my government being in power and the last year in particular, you'd never believe that has been the case. And if you listen to the opposition, and you know, Mr. President, it's an amazing thing, you know. I think sometimes that we just believe that St. Lucians are blind and foolish. The last Minister of National Security runs a newspaper in which he is perhaps the most vocal person on the crime issue. And in many instances has indicated that crime is extremely bad and has gone as far as trying to suggest that it is worse than when the last government was in office. Can you imagine that, Mr. President? Can you imagine that? He fell asleep at the wheel, absolutely and totally fell asleep until his boat was grounded on the rocks. But he says to us, in the face of these statistics that prove otherwise, he says to us that crime is worse now than it was when he was in charge and he ran the boat. But Mr. President, we have to be candid about this. There were some areas where we saw increases in summary offenses, and that is a troubling thing for my government because summary offenses, as you know, generally have the core of criminal offenses because they are lesser offenses, so to speak, and a lot of offenses are crammed into this. We saw an increase in summary offenses. And we also saw some increase, Mr. President, in offenses against property. But again, I go back. And I would say, Mr. President, for example, that even within that framework, in 2014, we recorded 29 or 30, and I say 29 or 30 murders, Mr. President, because when I was preparing for this, I noticed contradictory statements in, my, in, my, uh, in the literature that was given to me to prepare. In some instances, they said 29 murders. In others, they said 30. So I don't want to be held account for misleading. But if you take the outer figure of 30, we saw a decrease over the last year. And in fact, there have been three years of progressive decreases in murders in this country. And again, you'd never believe it. And I'm not glorifying what we have done here because as far as I'm concerned, if we have one murder, it is one too many. And we must find ways to bring this down as close to zero as we can. And we must find ways to be more robust about the social aspect to this problem. Because I always say, and I've said it in this Honorable Senate many a time, Mr. President, that what I do to a large degree is crime containment. And this shows that we are doing a good job at crime containment. But to resolve the deep-rooted issues that give rise to criminal activity we have a lot of social work to do, a lot of social work that will go and have to go for many, many years. It's not going to be today and tomorrow. It's not going to be five years of this government or any government. It's going to be 10, 20, 30 years down the road, and we have to do it. But I point to say that on this issue, issue of crime containment, we have done um, much given the limited resources that have been given to us in this difficult uh, fiscal situation. Now, Mr. President, one other area that is of concern, of course, has to do with firearms. But we also saw a decrease with assaults with firearms and also in the area of discharging um, firearms. There was, in fact, a decrease last year. But again, if you balance the scale, we saw an increase in the possession of firearms and the unlawful possession of ammunition. But this could well be pointing to the greater detection rate of the police and also to a more robust policing on this issue so that we are detecting more, that we are uncovering more. But again, as I have said, there's a balancing in that scale. But I'm still not satisfied here. And the firearm offenses, of course, 
are one of the areas where the country um, is very concerned and quite rightly so. But I can say to you that again in this area, Mr. President, we are doing what is necessary to contain, contain the problem and resolve some of the issues. Mr. President, as I round up, I will say that the government has an obligation, as I said earlier, to ensure that we provide a measure of support to those sectors that are vulnerable. We noted that in year before, years before, there were certain initiatives undertaken by my government, such as the relating to the issue of um, eye vision and hearing testing. We will note that again on page 52, Mr. President, of the budget statement of the Prime Minister, he again reinforces this determination that, and points that from January 2016, our government would introduce free vision and hearing tests for all children in grade two. And remember what we did with our Cuban brothers and sisters by ensuring that we provided this framework for our eye care in this country. And the last government did absolutely nothing to move it forward, but we are here again and we are moving it and continuing to move it incrementally in a different direction. And Mr. President, and equally, Mr. President, if you go to page 56 of the Prime Minister's budget address, as well as page 58, you will understand again the commitment of our government to ensuring that we reach out to the more vulnerable. And on page 58, Mr. President, it states quite in very quite clear terms, reflecting what we have in our estimates of revenue and expenditure for 2015 and 2016, that our government has committed 3.5 million to support two SSDF managed support programs, HOPE and Kudme St. Lucie. These will target households and communities and continue to address this issue of poverty. HOPE will receive $2 million. Kudme St. Lucie, $1.5 million. It will provide a range of supports, including education, bursaries, health assistance, and physical improvements to homes. Mr. President, we are also going to ensure that through our constituency input, and Mr. President, last year we spent approximately $8.7 million introducing a number of, of contracts in the constituencies, again, to ensure that there was employment. This is not just for the purpose of undertaking these constituency initiatives, which are important, but also to ensure that there is generation, there's a generation of employment throughout the various constituencies and the length and breadth of St. Lucia, through the length and breadth of St. Lucia. Mr. President, an important and fundamental proposal is the proposal to make adjustments in our income, income tax regime. That is important, Mr. President. Mr. President, the government is proposing a reduction in the income tax bans from four to three, an increase in the personal allowance threshold from 18,000 to $21,000. What well, that means in practical terms, Mr. President? 25. To 25,000, sorry, Mr. President. 
What that means in practical terms, Mr. President, is that we are now raising the bar, allowing more and more people who are being taxed to get out of the tax bracket. And we know, Mr. President, that a lot of our people earn very low wages, so that those below 25,000 will no longer have to pay tax on that income. This would allow roughly 2,100 persons to be removed from that tax bracket. And this is significant at this, at this time, Mr. President. At this time, when the country has to go through this adjustment, this fiscal adjustment and structural adjustment of its economy, where we know persons are hurting a bit, our government has taken the steps. This government has taken the steps to ensure that we bring ease to a wide band of persons in the tax bracket. Graphic, bracket. In fact, as I have said, 2,100 persons are expected to benefit from this. Mr. President, Mr. Mr. President, I will not go into all of the effects of the tax reforms. I would leave this for some of my other colleagues, but I just wanted to make that social uh, point that on the social side, the government, in fact, was moving to try to ensure that they buffered what was happening um, in terms of the economic adjustments. So, Mr. President, this has not been, I have not obviously covered everything that needs to be covered here. My colleagues will, um, will continue with some of this, but I hope that I have left a certain picture, Mr. President. And that picture is that we inherited a bad economy, an economy that was in decline, that was tumbling because of mismanagement. And of course, the last government is fond of saying that there was growth. But Mr. President, as we know, growth can be very artificial. It can be very artificial when the foundation upon which you're basing this growth is non-existent or in shambles. And this is what we found. Whilst there appeared to be growth, and the statistics began to show that there were massive problems under that growth. Part of those problems were spending and a failure to control spending on the part of the last government. A failure to control that spending. We have done it now to bring that foundation back to where it should be to ensure that growth can be sustained and realized by this government. So Mr. President, we have, I have shown the picture that this is what we inherited. We spent the first couple of years stabilizing the situation. We had to do some spending, and we are now at the point where we are seeing the light. And the light is that we are seeing the pillars of the economy, in particular the tourism industry, beginning to take its role. We are seeing fiscal consolidation taking place. We are seeing revenue consolidation taking place. And this is where a country wants to be and needs to be when it is digging itself out of a financial mess, a financial mess created by the last government. So, Mr. President, I urge full support of this appropriation bill. I would like to say that I am very confident in what I see. What I see is good for the future. It is positive for the next year, and I am fairly confident that we would be able to see not just further indicators of the strengthening of the economy in the next year, but we will begin to see our government start to show progress on the issue of unemployment, particularly among our young persons. I thank you, Mr. President.